subawards with subrecipients, hybrid POs with contractors, and purchase orders with contractors. Why should you care? I'll tell you why. To avoid funding shortfalls in project awards. So let's get started by gaining a basic understanding of the terms. A collaborator that is defined as a subrecipient is an organization that receives payment for performing a portion of the statement of work, including programmatic decision making. The form of agreement is a subaward, written, negotiated, and managed by the Office of Contract Administration. A contractor is an organization that receives payment for providing commercial goods and services. The forms of agreement at U of M include purchase orders, general services agreement, or consulting agreements that are written, negotiated, and managed by procurement services. For this presentation, we refer to these agreements collectively as purchase orders. A contractor may also be an organization that receives payment for providing non-commercial research services that are necessary for the study. The form of agreement is a hybrid contract written, negotiated by procurement specialists on site in the office contract administration. Generally speaking, a party to an agreement that does not meet the definition of a subrecipient is considered a contractor by the federal government. The Office of Contract Administration can help a project team determine the proper business relationship if adequate details are provided in the statement of work. Why is this important? Because indirect costs are assessed differently for subawards versus purchase orders and hybrid contracts. Subawards are assessed indirect costs only on the first $25,000 of the subaward amount. When the relationship is that of a contractor, indirect costs are assessed on 100% of the contracted amount. So understanding how to apply the appropriate classification will ensure you request the correct funding amount from the sponsor. This will avoid having to find other means to address the funding shortfalls, such as going back and requesting supplemental funding from the sponsor, or even worse, having to use your discretionary funds to support the project unexpectedly. It's critical during the proposal stage to define whether a transaction is or is not a subaward, so the correct IDC is requested. Some teams know the difference between the classifications. They simply don't want to ask the sponsor to pay the appropriate indirect cost U of M is entitled to receive for fear that the sponsor will consider the proposal way too costly and turn it down. At times, PIs are faced with sponsors that, whether or not U of M is entitled to the full indirects, the sponsor refuses to pay indirects on 100% of the proposed contracts. It's best to work with your financial manager at the proposal stage to determine funding alternatives rather than misclassify a recipient, especially when the organization is funded under a federal award to ensure U of M is in compliance with the requirements of the uniform guidance. Let's look at the budget implications as demonstrated by examining several scenarios subsequent to U of M receiving an award that includes $100,000 in direct costs earmarked for subcontracting. U of M's indirect cost rate use in our example is 55%. The collaborator is classified as a subrecipient. A subaward is issued, therefore the indirect cost recovery is $13,750, which is equal to 55% of the first $25,000 of the contracted amount. In scenario two, the collaborator is classified as a contractor. When a hybrid contract is issued, the indirect cost recovery is $55,000, which is equal to 55% on 100% of the contracted amount. In scenario three, when purchasing goods and services from an organization that are available commercially from the organization, the collaborator is classified as a contractor. A purchase order is issued, therefore the indirect cost recovery is $55,000, which is equal to 55% of 100% of the contracted amount. So, if an organization is classified as a subawardee or subrecipient, when it should have been classified as a contractor, U of M fails to recover the full amount of indirect costs it's entitled to. In our scenarios, the unrecovered amount is $41,250.
This chart summarizes what we've discussed so far. It provides you with the type of agreement, the classification of the organization, whether it's subrecipient or contractor, which department processes the agreement, what mechanism is used to request the contract, and indirect cost assessment. Let's now look at the characteristics of both a subrecipient and a contractor. Any collaborator that isn't a subrecipient is considered a contractor. The hybrid contract can be confusing because it can fall anywhere on the spectrum between the subaward and purchase order. The relationship will determine the form of agreement used and how the project is audited. The key personnel at the subrecipient organization may be a co-principal investigator on the study. This person may share programmatic decision-making responsibility with U of M, may co-author or write the study protocol, or is independently responsible for ensuring a portion of the statement of work is completed, may determine who is eligible to participate in the federal program, has performance measured in relation to whether objectives of the federal program were met. Stanford University's policy statement summarizes it well. The subrecipient assumes creative and intellectual responsibility and leadership as well as financial management for performing and fulfilling the subrecipient's statement of work within the subrecipient's approved budget. Let's look at the other end of the spectrum, or the purchase order. A procurement services contract or purchase order is a traditional commercial transaction. When U of M enters into this type of agreement, it is usually work for hire. Along with the purchase, U of M expects that it will own all the intellectual property, including the contractor's notes. There are warranties and performance expectations consistent with industry standards. U of M can expect the contractor to offer the products or services commercially to any organization wishing to purchase them, provide the goods and services within normal business operations, and operate in a competitive environment. These contracts are ancillary or in other words, the organization provides necessary support to the study, but U of M remains ultimately responsible for the outcome of the program. When U of M enters into a hybrid contract transaction, U of M is purchasing non-commercial research services in support of the project. The contractor is not responsible for programmatic decision making. The contractor retains IP rights for discoveries, provide input regarding the protocol, has access to the study data, and may even be a co-author in the primary papers, but U of M remains responsible and accountable to the sponsor for the program. Some characteristics of a contractor under a hybrid agreement are the contractor does not offer the services commercially, the contractor provides services that are necessary for conducting the study, however, they could be performed by others. The contractors are substitutable. This is especially true with clinical trials. The contractor may have an investigator on the team who might participate in co-authoring papers in providing input for the protocol and participating on steering committees. But ultimately, this person does not have responsibility for the programmatic decision making. The federal government considers these hybrid relationships as procurement transactions. However, the traditional procurement form of agreement is inappropriate. Hybrids are very much a research collaboration, so a commercial general services agreement issued through the Procurement Services Department doesn't fit. For example, Wayne State University isn't going to agree to terms and conditions that, if they discover something while providing support services to U of M on a study, U of M will own the discovery, much like you would find in a standard work for hire agreement. Another example is when providing research support by executing a protocol, collaborators aren't going to guarantee or warranty certain outcomes. There are no guarantees in research. There is a myth on campus that if a contract is cost reimbursable, it has to be a subaward. This is not true. Another myth is that if the individual at the other organization provides input during the protocol development, participates on steering committees or co-authors papers, they are a subrecipient. 
To fully understand how to determine the difference between a subrecipient and contractor, let's discuss real examples that occurred at U of M. We contrast subrecipient and contractor relationships within a clinical trial project. Let's imagine that Michigan received a grant from the National Institutes of Health to conduct a clinical trial. The protocol for the clinical trial is co-authored by an investigator from the University of Michigan and an investigator from the University of Utah. The investigator from the University of Utah is responsible for writing the manual of operations and subcontractor monitoring for the duration of the study. Michigan will draft, negotiate, and administer the contracts with the participating sites, establish a steering committee, and draft the data safety monitoring plan with input from the University of Utah. The contract between U of M and Utah is a subaward, with Utah being a subrecipient. This is truly a co-principal investigator relationship. The investigators at Michigan and Utah share in the programmatic design and decision making. The sponsor considers both the investigator from the University of Michigan and the investigator from the University of Utah co-principal investigators. The form of agreement is a subaward. The contract is subject to indirect costs only on the first $25,000 and the contract will be processed and administered by the Office of Contract Administration. Now, in our multi-center clinical trial example, let's say that this is a drug study and the University of Michigan Pharmacy is unable to provide the support services to the study related to the drug distribution. It is one of many contract development and manufacturing organizations in the pharmaceutical industry. The University of Michigan enters into a contract with Almac Group to provide both the study drug and placebo as well as code and track the drug shipments. The Almac Group is a contractor, the form of agreement is a purchase order issued by procurement services, and there is indirect cost paid by the sponsor on 100% of the contracted amount. What makes Almac Group a contractor? Almac Group provides the goods and services within normal business operations, provides similar goods and services to many different purchasers, normally operates in a competitive environment, and provides goods and services that are ancillary to the operation of the federal program. Now let's add in 10 participating sites to the study that will implement the same protocol, which involves recruiting and enrolling study subjects in accordance with the established protocol written by Michigan and Utah, drawing blood samples, participating on the steering committee, submitting data, to the Data Coordinating Center and providing input and assisting with the preparation of manuscripts. The participating sites are contractors. The form of agreement is a hybrid contract issued by the Office of Contract Administration. It's indirect cost paid by the sponsor on 100% of the contracted amount. If you mischaracterize the collaborative organization, there may be additional costs for your department or your sponsor to cover. The deans and major directors at the University of Michigan rely on recovering indirect costs. Nobody in central administration has the authority to waive the charging of any indirect costs. Also, rewriting the statement of work so it includes all the buzzwords that you'd normally find in the subaward isn't going to change the evaluation. If you mischaracterize the collaborative organization, you will have to visit your unit's financial manager or research dean's office to determine alternatives for correcting the budget's shortfalls. If you are ever uncertain whether or not a contract should be classified as a subaward or a hybrid, in the proposal stage, contact the Office of Contract Administration and someone will be happy to help you make a determination. Thank you very much for taking the time to view this video. It was created in collaboration between Procurement Services, the Office of Contract Administration, and the Office of Research and Sponsored Projects.